Constructions Electricus Marbin, Marbin Radio 510A, Early 1950s. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project, available in video and in written form, made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. Constructions Electricus Marbin Paris was producing radios from the 1930s with the brand Malovox. Towards the end of the 1940s up to the early 1950s there must have also been a production branded Marbin radio, but with very little information available online. Later, Constructions Electric was Marbin produced or commercialized other products with the usual brand Malovox until the end of the 1960s. The model of the item under restoration is completely undocumented, but due to the presence of some modern IF transformers and due to the particular cabinet style with ears, very popular in the early 1950s in France, it must have been made in that period. Nevertheless, electrically the radio has been designed as if it had been made in the early 1940s, including a loudspeaker with field coil and old-style dog bone resistors. Very likely the item under restoration has been built as a kit because the components had been soldered without wrapping the terminals around the posts. The item under restoration arrived electrically intact. It was barely noticeable that the filter capacitor can had been replaced with a thinner one. Everything else seemed original. The cabinet was the most important reason for concern the veneer was peeling off in various places, and the bottom of the cabinet was significantly bent. The radio must have been exposed to wood dust that reached every surface and every component. The original power cord was cut, which suggests that the radio was put aside because it was not working anymore. In fact, the loudspeaker field coil was open. The loudspeaker cone had also been stabbed with a long needle from outside the grill cloth. The field coil is removed from the loudspeaker to check the condition of the copper wire and see if it is possible to repair it. What is visible now at the bottom with very few turns is the humbucking coil used to cancel out the hum generated by the audio stages for the presence of residual ripple in the B+. The paper tape around the field coil contains a number that very likely represents the DC resistance of the coil, 1200 ohms. The copper wire is very thin, 0.1 millimeters, but it seems to be in very good condition and a last attempt to see if the problem could have been generated only by a bad contact with the external wires is made, but with no success. So the field coil is unwound, collecting the wire with the intention of reusing it, hoping to find the break in the external turns.
This field coil was wound using two different copper wires that are joined together. Deeper in the darker turns the interruption will be found, but there is no video about that. Anyhow, almost 20% of the copper is ruined and not reusable anymore. Here the process of rewinding the field coils is already well advanced. Even though there is much less wire in the original spool, it seems full again. That happens because the wire was not distributed evenly while winding it. Measuring the DC resistance, the field coil has now only one kilo ohm which is consistent with the loss of wire and the expected original DC resistance of 1.2 kilo ohms. The radio chassis can now be tested in its original condition before proceeding with the restoration, and the result is comforting. The voltage read by the voltmeter is the B+, plus, which appears low, because the chassis is powered through a dim bulb tester, receiving much less AC voltage than it should in normal conditions. The test shows a scratchy volume potentiometer, and also a shorting variable capacitor when the blades are almost fully meshed. The variable capacitor seems to have a short. Therefore, it is separated from the chassis to verify its condition and see if the short can be fixed. The variable capacitor is installed on a dial panel that has to be removed as well.
The band selector switch controls its own indicator with a short cord which has to be cut for the purpose of removing the dial panel. There is indeed a short. The drum is located between the dial panel and the variable capacitor. The drum is freed from the shaft before removing the variable capacitor. There is also an adapter plate to remove. It holds the variable capacitor with grommets. This was a very modern variable capacitor including a plastic cover to keep the dust away from the plates, which in fact were particularly close spaced. Unfortunately, there seems to be no other way than breaking this cover to remove it. It is observed that the rotor blades are pushed too much toward the front, and they should be slightly moved back. After some experimenting, it is observed that the small spring plate at the back is responsible for pushing the rotor forward and that pressure is what should be adjusted to fix the problem. The variable capacitor is tested with the omitter for shorts, but it does not beep, so now the blades seem to be properly spaced. The old grommets are replaced with new ones. Then the adapter is mounted on the variable capacitor again. The variable capacitor, with its adapter, is installed again on the dial panel. For now the dial cords are still the original ones, but later one of them will be replaced because it will appear slightly torn. As seen while testing the radio the first time, the volume potentiometer needs to be cleaned. For that it is necessary to open it. Thank you. 
Luckily, everything seems intact inside, and some cleaning oil is used. On the back of the small potentiometer case, there is the power switch. Therefore, while putting it all back together, the shaft must be aligned correctly. Unfortunately, the little flaps are very fragile, and they cannot stand being bent twice. So they break very easily. Because the potentiometer is otherwise perfectly working, some nylon zip ties are used to hold the potentiometer together. For now it is not a nice looking potentiometer, but it is the original one, and if there will be a second thought about it, it will still be possible to glue it together. The plan for the electrical restoration is to replace all electrolytic and paper capacitors and all resistors which appear to have a significantly higher value than their nominal one. The component replacement job starts around the final amplifier tube socket.
In the original arrangement of this radio, there were no fuses. In this restoration, two fuses will be added. The chassis is still intact, and it was very carefully coated with zinc. Therefore, instead of making holes for the fuse holders, a couple of short standoffs are soldered in the power supply area. A special low melting point solder is used. It contains tin and bismuth, but it does not contain resin, therefore the flux must be added when using it. A tag strip is soldered to the chassis for holding two safety capacitors. Consequently, the paper capacitor that was used to filter the noise generated by the power switch is removed. A proper power cord is going to be installed. A grommet is inserted in the original hole on the chassis. power cord has just the right size for the grommet that has been inserted. Two small zip ties are used to secure the end of the power cord inside the chassis. With the help of super glue, the cord is fastened to the grommet and the chassis so that it will not be able to move in any way. This radio uses a regular isolation transformer and it is possible to connect the chassis to the external ground. The wires of the power cord must go straight to the fuses.
two safety capacitors are installed after the fuses. This radio absorbs about 50 watts, which means that with a voltage of 230 volts, that would correspond to a little more than 200 milliamps. Nevertheless, fuses type F0.1 amps are installed because they have been tested and will not blow until about 800 milliamps. Another tag strip is going to be installed. It will serve to anchor the replacement electrolytic filter capacitors. The field coil has been repaired but it now has a lower DC resistance. Therefore, a 220 ohms 5 watts resistor is added in series. On this radio, the B plus is distributed via thick and not insulated wire that travels above the other components. This makes it easy to connect with the B plus line, but dangerous while servicing the radio. The new filter capacitors are installed. A simple trick is used to make the B-plus line more noticeable. Some red heat shrink pipe is shrunk and cut lengthwise so that it can be inserted around the wire and fixed with some super glue. It would only make the B-plus line more visible, reducing the chances of getting in touch with it. The rest of the electrical restoration is documented only by a few pictures. This is the overview of the final arrangement under the chassis including the connections of the variable capacitor to the band selector module. The original arrangement of components was mapped into this chart. However, in the meantime, the item under restoration has been slightly modified, adding fuses, safety capacitors on the power line, and later also isolating the antenna ground from the chassis with another safety capacitor.
Here are all the replaced parts of this restoration, but something about them is described later in this video. All the discarded parts are saved like for all the other projects of this series. There is always the chance to do something stupid with the voltage selector, also with all the good intentions. In Europe the domestic mains provides 230 volts, and on this radio there is no other suitable selection than the 245 volts. If a radio is meant to be used, like in this case, it is advisable to make sure that it could not be damaged by a wrong voltage selection without relying just on the fuses. In fact, the fuses are there against fire hazard and cannot provide the function of current regulators. This is the reverse engineered schematic diagram of the original arrangement of this radio. During the restoration it has been slightly modified, disconnecting all input voltages except the one for 245 volts, including two fuses and two noise filtering safety capacitors. Also the chassis has been isolated from the antenna ground as an extra precaution in case somebody disconnected the ground connection from the power plug. Nothing has been done to the phono input or pickup, as it is unknown the reason why it wasn't coupled with a capacitor. However, it should not be used, and the corresponding hole on the back panel will be closed. Please notice that it has been impossible to reverse engineer the band selector module, and what is visible here with a yellow background is a generic arrangement which might be correct for the medium wave band, but not for the other bands. Anyhow, the values of the inductors and capacitors are not known. At the time in which this radio was made, in Europe there was no standard for the frequency to use in the IF chain. As there is no documentation about the radio, and the same is for most of the other French radios of that time, it is impossible even to make a guess. Using a signal generator, it is found to what intermediate frequency the radio appears to be somehow peaked. The frequency found is 473 kHz, and the same is used for repeating the alignment. The IF transformers had not been sealed with wax like it was usually done, but for that reason, the ferrite cores are also a little bit loose, making any alignment unreliable. To solve the problem and keep the ferrite cores in place, some wax coming from a tea light is used, applying it with a small brush. And when necessary, the heat gun is also used to soften the wax already applied. In the end, to verify the alignment visually, a sweeping signal between 463 and 483 kHz has been applied to the top cap of the first tube, type 6 yite. The negative value of the AVC, red at the phono input, has been used to draw the bell curve. The curve appears upside down on the screen because the most negative value represents the higher signal. After that, it would be possible to adjust the cores of the band selector, but with the IF chain aligned, the reception of the radio appears already very good in all bands, and it is judged safer to leave the band selector module alone. The dial glass is held on the dial panel only from above. 
At its base, the glass is just sitting on two rectangular grommets. At the bottom it is not possible to put anything to hold the glass on its panel, because it would stick out of the decorative metal frame, while inserting the chassis back in the radio cabinet. Most of the surface of the dial glass was meant to be a mirror. Unfortunately, by now that background has deteriorated and it is ruined. The dial glass has been scanned and the result has been edited in case it were necessary to make a reproduction. However, here the mirrored surface appears black. As usual, a better detailed picture is available in the written documentation that comes along with the video. The dial glass was designed with a space that could be used by a magic eye tube, which was covered if that tube wasn't installed. But the paint used to cover the magic eye area was meant to be easily removable in case of an upgrade of the radio. This unit came without a magic eye tube, but on the corresponding area of the dial glass the paint is chipping off. Therefore the residues are removed. The space between the wavelength values is cleaned without touching the numbers Later the dial glass will be sprayed with clear lacquer on the back to preserve what has remained of them. Even though the mirrored surface is ruined on various important spots, the dial scale can still be used, and when the dial glass is backlit with the pilot lights, all the mirrored surface appears evenly black. Therefore, after cleaning and spraying it with clear lacquer, the original dial glass is installed. At the bottom, flat screws are used to hold the special grommets because it is better to avoid the electrical contact between the chassis and the decorative frame. Also, some felt is added for the purpose of keeping this separation. The dial string arrangement of this radio is not so straightforward. There are two dial cords wrapped around the same drum. One dial cord is responsible for turning the drum, while the other is responsible to transfer the rotation of the drum to the movement of the dial indicator. Unfortunately, the first one was found slightly torn and it was necessary to replace it. Here fishing wire of about half a millimeter diameter is used. Fishing wire is an effective and lasting solution, but it can be difficult to actually install it. Many attempts had to be done to get the desired result. When the dial glass was already installed, it was possible to notice that the second cord, the one responsible for the indicator movement, was too loose, resulting in a dial pointer that was hanging down. To put some tension to that cord without removing the variable capacitor, that was already installed at that point, a simple trick has been used. Later, when the chassis was inserted again in the restored cabinet, the dial was fitting perfectly. The radio arrived with a cabinet that was not in good condition but still recoverable. 
the main issues were a significantly bent bottom and the veneer peeling off in various places. Luckily, all the detached veneer pieces arrived with the radio. The general impression was that the glue originally used to construct the cabinet was not good enough or had been applied to diluted. It was also unclear how the construction of the cabinet was designed because various parts were not glued at all, even though somehow they were holding in place. First of all, the loose pieces of veneer have been glued. Then the piece of wood that was the cause of a bent bottom was removed, so that the bottom panel could be moistened and straightened with the help of an iron bar and some clamps. The third step, which took many days, involved pouring a lot of vinyl glue between the cracks of the cabinet that had not been glued by the factory. That was probably unnecessary in the original condition of the cabinet when it was new. However, the bent bottom was partly detached from the two side panels, and there wasn't the possibility to reach the cabinet cracks differently. Therefore, this solution of pouring glue has been used and extended to all other cracks, even if not directly involved in the damage. It was then the time to put a longer piece of timber at the back of the bottom panel. The bottom panel was still bent, but with less strength. The new piece of timber was then glued and held again with the same iron bar and the same clamps. The plan was to put screws to keep holding together the bottom panel to the timber with the assumption that the hardened glue could have held for a couple of minutes allowing to remove the iron bar. But it didn't. So the timber has been glued again, but pressed to the bottom panel without the aid of the iron bar leaving the space for inserting the screws. When all the screws had been put in place, and the clamps were not needed anymore, it was time for taking care of the external appearance of the cabinet. The external surface has been cleaned with the help of some acetone, which also helped in smoothening and redistributing the original lacquer. Then, with some fine sandpaper, 220 grit. The surface has been scratched, but without removing completely the original lacquer. On the scratched surface, some wood stain has been applied. When the stain dried, some new opaque clear lacquer 
was sprayed on the cabinet because the surface is too uneven and making it glossy would have shown better the defects. After the lacquer, also some wax has been applied and later polished. There is a decorative metal frame that had to be removed to allow working on the cabinet. It is made of a very thin iron sheet and it is installed by folding some flaps held to the cabinet by very thin and short screws. Unfortunately, unlike the chassis, the iron sheet is not protected by a zinc coat and has suffered significant deterioration. For the purpose of cleaning the frame from the old lacquer and the rust, outdoors it has been submerged in water pouring in a very little amount of muriatic acid. After one day, the frame has been cleaned from the old lacquer and from some of the original corrosion. However, the remaining rust required more treatment using a gel rust remover, but mostly with the purpose of stopping the rust from developing further. This because a too thin iron sheet would not have allowed the complete removal of the corrosion signs without compromising its integrity. There are four small and fragile flaps that are meant to cover holes with the purpose of giving the impression that the frame is made of solid metal instead of being just a thin sheet of iron. However, there is nothing where these flaps could safely rest. They might be inadvertently pressed, or they could get entangled with something, or even become dangerous hooks. To attach them to something, some solder is applied inside the frame behind them, after cleaning the treated frame from residues, it has been painted first with a zinc coat and then with an acrylic golden color. The frame is installed on the cabinet, inserting it from outside and bending some flaps that later should be attached with screws to the internal cabinet wood. Two of those flaps were already cut from the factory because at their place the cabinet wood is too thin for using screws. Unfortunately, the original screws are in too bad condition for being reused and lacking the proper size for replacing them. Some very short M2 screws are used instead. In the end, the remains of the cut flaps that could not be used are attached with hot glue. The original grill cloth was in very bad condition and it has been replaced. The panel where the original grill cloth was glued has been cleaned and the screws, all rusty, have been replaced, fixing the new ones with super glue. They appear here covered with some tape. The glue that is applied on the panel is used to stick to the new fabric. The clips that follow are self-explanatory. Finally, the loudspeaker can be installed again. 
a small spade connector has been added to facilitate the connection to the chassis. The chassis is put back in the cabinet and then also the vacuum tubes are installed again. When it is time to put the back panel in place, everything seems okay, but then a major safety issue becomes evident. The voltage selector is exposed and therefore also the mains becomes exposed. The idea was to attach with super glue a piece of plastic to cover the hole on the back panel. Unfortunately, the chosen plastic is not good for super glue and a different type of general purpose glue has to be applied. Also the hole for the phono input is covered because it is not coupled with a capacitor and there is no plan for using it. The radio arrived with its original knobs with a decorative mirror glass. However these decorations were severely deteriorated in a much worse condition than the dial glass. After cleaning the knobs carefully, the same fabric used for the grill cloth is cut to take the place of the original knob decoration. If possible, I like to save the previous history of a radio that I deal with. In this case, we know that it could have been a kit of the early 50s. We also know that the radio has been repaired, replacing the electrolytic capacitor can and fixing the variable capacitor. We assume that, at the time of the early repair, the owner could have been Mr. or Ms. Perrett, the name written on the variable capacitor. The person from Mintrashard who gave me this radio reported that he owned that radio for about 10 years and that before him it was owned by a gentleman in Cayenne. I will save all this in a label inside the cabinet. The Marbin Radio 510A is ready. The test is done about an hour before midnight using an indoor loop antenna, starting from the long wave band, ending with the short wave band.
It is remarkable that in this area, this radio can actually receive stations in the long wave band.
If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics equipment or old radios in whatever condition they might be, provided that you do not feel any attachment that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation and video production,